Angel, we're getting ready to. Yeah. Yes, sir. You want to? Thank you for reminding us. So we and Daniel, I'm not going to read the whole chapter tonight just for sake of time. Actually, I want to get started with something a little bit different tonight. I don't normally do this kind of thing, but I'm just kind of excited to be honest with you. I hope y'all are excited too with just the way that our church is and that everybody's hungry to, to learn more. And I really enjoyed last week whenever people were interjecting. Hannah had uh, asked some things. I can't remember if Vince didn't ask, but she interjected Robert said some things here and, and it just created a really good uh, I felt like it was a good environment for discussion yeah. um, and uh, you know I just I just I'm excited about the way that our church is that way and I can tell you that I don't think that we all completely agree on every single little thing and I got to tell you that as a preacher I'm perfectly fine with that and I've made that comment before I don't need everybody just to believe what I'm saying just to believe it as a matter of fact I turned to um, Acts chapter 17 earlier when I was thinking about that and the Apostle Paul, whenever he was traveling in Asia Minor and he was bringing the gospel, the Bible says that he had left Thessalonica and he went to a place called Berea. And when he went to Berea, the Bible says of the Bereans, that's why if you ever heard people say, man, I want to be a Berean. You might not have ever heard that terminology before, but in the church, if you've been in the church for a long time, you've heard it. I want to be a Berean. Okay, well, what they mean is, is that the word of God says Luke wrote the book of Acts and the Bible says that those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And this is why they were more noble because they received the word of God with joy. And they went home and studied the scriptures for themselves, check this out, to make sure that what the Apostle Paul was telling them was the right thing. <laughs> Did you just get that? <laughs> to make sure that the Apostle Paul, who died in a Roman prison, was telling them the right thing. Amen? And so listen, I just want to encourage you, listen, no man in your life should you buy in so deeply that you don't go back and double check for yourself. Sorry, That's right. definitely not this dude and, and not anyone else. You hear me? You need, we need to study to show ourselves approved. The, a workman that rightly divides the word of truth, he shall not be ashamed. So I believe that that's what we are. I believe we're Bereans. Now, I got to tell you that what one of the main topics that came up, and so we're going to kind of look at a couple of things before we get into Daniel chapter 10. Um, one of the main things that came up was the, we, the topic of the fact that he was a Syrian Jew. Am I correct in saying that? That we were that the word Syrian was used, yeah. and and that's because. And so, I want to make I want to make some points about that. We I think that we have to be careful when we say a Syrian Jew. Now, I just happened when I woke up at three o'clock this morning. And I would have loved to have gone back to sleep, but I couldn't go back to sleep. So I said, this is a perfect time to grab the iPad and start studying. Amen. And I happened upon an article that I was not looking for. Never saw this article before. Don't even know who this dude's name is, to be honest with you. But he's obviously a professor from Liberty University, which is, I'm pretty sure that's where Gabriel Swagger went to Bible college. But anyway, nevertheless, I started to read the, the article and it had a lot of information in it that, that I actually have already said. In, in these services before and it it happened to talk about I didn't Google I did go I, I, I googled is the Antichrist a Jew that's what I did and this article came up so I started to read this article and what I and what I like about this article and what I want to encourage all to understand is is that sometimes whenever we view something from a particular angle that if we never try to look at it from a different angle then we just only see it from a particular angle and so again, I'm not trying to pretend that this guy's opinion's even right. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just saying it's a different angle. I made a few copies in the back if somebody wants to grab a copy. It's really just, I, use, I would say you utilize it as a study guide is what you would do to see, okay? So we're just gonna mention a couple of things. The first thing that I wanna mention to you is the concept, because this is what goes on in my mind because I love maps, y'all know that. I draw maps, I read, study maps, I read maps, I try to learn biblical geography. Why do you learn biblical geography? Well, because one time I was at a pre-camp meeting over there in Baton Rouge and they used to have a guy over there named Dr. David Stone. And I used to hear him on the radio and I went up to Dr. Stone and I said, hey man, I really want to understand the Bible. What do you recommend? Get you a Bible atlas and learn Bible geography. That's all he said. 
So I got to tell you that I started to embark upon that journey of practicing, understanding maps and various things. And one of the things that I can tell you is, is that when I first started talking about the Bible, I didn't really know much of anything about the Bible. But I probably could have told you a little bit about the highway from Morgan City to Homa <laughs> because I drove it every day when I went work at Terrible in general. And I can tell you about downtown Homa because I kind of like lived there and I hung out there and also could tell you about Morgan City. What am I trying to say? If you're not familiar with your surroundings, it makes it difficult for you to understand. I'm actually going to read a lot of uh, some of the article, because, but I don't typically read things. But again, first thing that I want to talk to you about is Assyria versus Syria. So first, I want to talk to you about where does he come from? Does he come from Syria? Okay, and I want to make this point. See, this is how my brain works. I hope you don't mind if we do this. So we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 14. And then we're going to take a look at verse 25. Uh, and so this is what it says. That I will break the Assyrian. So this is the terminology that is being used. There's two spots in the Bible, two spots in the Old Testament that refer to that where we get the concept of the Antichrist being the Assyrian. I want to make that clear. It doesn't say the Syrian. It says the Assyrian. Uh, Syrian and, and and this points out to me because again I understand because of studying maps that there's a big difference between Assyria and Syria and we're about to look at that in a second. He says we're going to break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountain tread him underfoot then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off there there should this and it goes on okay so let's talk about the Assyrian now let's go to Micah. Chapter 5, verse 2. Anybody familiar with the prophecy of Micah? Do y'all remember what that prophecy speaks of? Specifically, anybody? Bethlehem. Shout it out. Thank you, Ham. Bethlehem. That's where the Savior was born. This is the Old Testament prophecy. It's something wrong with my... Man, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I don't know what's wrong with my thing, man. I'm, oh, yeah, you know what? Let me, uh, let me <laughs> bring it down a little bit. I don't know. Let's see. Sorry. Can you read that? All right, here we go. I gotta hold it over to the side. Something's wrong with our screen. Did y'all change the screens back there? Come on, man. I think it reset itself. That's okay. We're not gonna do that. But thou, I tell you what. Can I get off of here and you can put the scriptures on the on the screen? Yeah. Let's, no, no. Let's not do that. Let's just read. Sorry. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. All right, so just so you understand a little bit about geography, Judah is the southern portion of the nation of Israel. Bethlehem is about six miles south of Jerusalem. Bethlehem, what is the name of Bethlehem? It's, it's, it's called the house of bread. All right, there's a whole story in the book of Ruth that's so beautiful about that. But nevertheless, that's where David was from, and that's where Jesus was born. Amen? Thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth. Who's he? The one that they were waiting for. The Messiah, the Christ. Amen? He shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old. What does that mean? God planned him from the beginning. God has a plan. He's going to send us Jesus. Amen? He was going to be born in Bethlehem. The prophet is letting us know where he comes from. All right. From everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travails has brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, and the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and they shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth, and this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. And when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. So here we go. We got two scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about the Assyrian. And the Assyrian is the Antichrist. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at some maps. I want to just show you something real quick. This is a bad map, but it is it's the only map I could. I tried to expand it. I don't need you to read the letters. I don't need you to read the letters. I'm about to help you out. You ready? We're going to do a screenshot. And then I'm going to pick it up a little bit. So just calm down. I think this is going to work. All right. So it is what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to, so what I'm trying to show you is this. 
This is what I want you to see. You see this right here where I'm circling that in red? You know what that is? You don't know. Is that That's working? Egypt. Didn't it didn't circle. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Well, let me just come stand over here and let me just show you. Can y'all Yeah, but y'all can't see from over there. Down here at the left, the left corner. Okay, that's, that's Egypt. All right, that's the Nile River. You can't see it, but the three-headed river that flows into one. Way over here on the right side. Oh, yeah, these people over here. What are y'all going to have to just listen? <laughs> Way over here on the right side is Babylon. This is Persia right here, okay? This is the Tigris and the Euphrates, and they flow into the Persian Gulf down here. So this is Persia. This is Iraq, all right? And then way over here, well, not, that's, not, that's the wrong map. I'm going to draw you a map later, but so you see it. This is this is Persia. This is Egypt. This is Israel. Israel is right here. This is where Syria is. It's a it's a nation, okay. But look, this is the Assyrian Empire, okay. It started with Nimrod way back in Genesis chapter 11. He built the Assyrian. He started it. But listen, this is where the Northern Kingdom was taken captive. Y'all remember that? 756 BC. The Assyrian army took the northern kingdom of Israel captive. So what is my point? My point is, is that for us to say that he's coming from Syria, I'm just not positive that, that, that we can hang our hat on. You understand what I'm saying? He's the Assyrian. So that means that he can come from this big swath of land right here is what the scripture is talking about, which includes Babylon, it includes Persia, it includes Egypt. It includes Israel, it includes Syria, it includes other parts of that big area that was previously the Assyrian Empire. So the Bible does call him the Assyrian, and I do expect that he will come from here, but also this is part of the Roman Empire, all right? So, um, which is, but the Roman Empire came much later. All right, this is the, uh, that's a picture of the church. All right. <laughs> So it's not going to do me a whole lot of good to sit here and try to screenshot again because I don't think it's going to let me draw. And I thought that was going to be real cool, but it wasn't. So you see here, that's the difference. That's Syria, the nation now today, is above there. And then you got Lebanon, that little piece. But you see the difference? I'm just trying to show you the difference between Syria and Assyria. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? So the Bible calls him the Assyrian. All right. So that was the first thing I wanted you to see. And then um, the next thing was I have this little article that, that's back there. And, and I thought it was interesting. And much of this article, I don't expect you to be able to read this, okay? There's a couple of copies back there. They might have already been taken up. We can make more copies if you want it. But I'm just trying to, to give you a little bit of a concept of what this person's opinion is. This is a person's opinion, but he's got scripture in here. And so we're going to look at the scripture to see what it is that he's saying. So the whole article is about... The ethnicity of the Antichrist. Now, I don't really want to read all his intro there, but one of the things he says in the second paragraph is that the earliest expounders of the Antichrist, he goes back to the Catholic Church tradition, was that the Antichrist, it talks about Irenaeus. If you never studied the Church Fathers, these names may not mean anything, but the Bishop, uh, Bishop of Hippo or Hippolytus, uh, the Antichrist would be a Jew. It seems clear that the Bishop... And it goes on to say, Irenaeus, that both Jewish and Christian uh, history claimed that the Antichrist would be born a Jew. And then they go on to say specifically from the tribe of Dan. He talks about it in this introduction. Why did they mention the tribe of Dan? Because in the book of Revelation, the tribe of Dan is missing. But interesting enough, in the book of Ezekiel, the millennial tribes, when they're mentioned, Dan's in there. So, you know, we don't, we don't, we're, gonna, we're not going to know everything on this side, but I will say that when we get to glory, the Lord will reveal it to us. All right. I want you to see this, this right here. This was too interesting to me. Anybody read any of these commentaries before? I know some of you have. This was my first one. This is, this was my favorite one ever. This is Brother Swagger's Hebrews commentary. It's got, I mean, 824 pages. First one I read when I got, when I, when the Lord got a hold of me. And, uh, and I read, it took me about four months to read it. I read it from cover to cover. This one here, I read, I don't know, I was on vacation one time and I finished it up in Gulf Shores. This is the book of Revelation. I read that one from cover to cover. Anybody read any of those from cover to cover? I'm just curious. Nice. Awesome. Do y'all remember hearing a guy pink in there a lot? He used to, he quoted a guy named Arthur Pink a lot. Look at this right here. I just happened to find this. 
A Jewish Antichrist notion is sometimes taught by our own dispensational prophecy teachers of today. A.W. Pink provides just such an argument in his well-known work on Antichrist as follows. This is a quote from Pink. It should, however, be pointed out that there is no express declaration of Scripture which says, and we're going to look at the Scripture, in so many words that this daring rebel, talking about the Antichrist, will be a Jew. Nevertheless, the hints given are so plain, the conclusions which must be drawn from certain statements of Holy Writ are so obvious, and the requirements of the case are so inevitable that we are forced to believe he must be a Jew. Now, let me just tell you this. There's a lot of types. There's a lot of shadows. There's a lot of things in the Word of God that I am being convinced of, even though there's not a specific scripture that says something. But I will tell you this. If there's not a specific scripture that t tells me something, I am not hanging my hat on it, friend. D does that make sense what I'm trying to say? I just hope you can at least follow along with me. I'm not hanging. If there's not a specific scripture that says it, I'm not hanging. I, I, listen, I'll dissect it. I'll look at it. I'll, I'll roll it over in my mind multiple times. And, and sometimes it will influence my thinking. And I'll tell you, in my opinion, I believe this to be true, but I'm not hanging my hat on it. All right? So... So let's keep going. Such a statement not only reveals his viewpoint, but also is also telling in that he's basically admitting that this, his view lacks direct biblical support, as he says, I will seek to demonstrate. And I don't know that his argument completely convinced me either. I'm just going to be honest with you. Okay, but he made some good points. All right. Three reasons are often given in support of the argument that Antichrist will be Jewish. The first one has to do with anti-Semitism. That's ridiculous to me. We're not even going to cover that. That means people that hate Jews, so they want to blame things on the Jews. The second major argument is that the Antichrist must be a Jew, since the Jews would only accept a Jew as their Messiah. An advocate of this view is Grant Jeffrey, who reasons that the Jews would one day accept for a time the false claims of the Antichrist as their promised Messiah. Since the prophecies tell us that the Antichrist will present himself to Israel as the Messiah, many scholars have concluded that he must be Jewish. Certainly no religious Jew would dream of accepting a Gentile as the Messiah of Israel. You know, while we're on that, have you ever met a Jewish person? Like a, a So one time, I'm just going to tell you my personal story one time of meeting a girl that was of Jewish descendants. Okay? I was working at the clinic. She was a nurse practitioner student, and I was training her. And all of a sudden, I realized she was a Jew. And I was, like, so excited, man. Like, I was so fired up. I was like, man, you're Jewish? Tell me about Passover. And I was getting all excited. And she's like, well, we're kind of secular Jews. Meaning they didn't practice Passover. They didn't believe in the Bible. I was so disappointed. I was so excited. And I kind of made her feel really, really weird, right? Because she's like, yeah, well, we're kind of secular Jews. What does that mean? That means she was born of Jewish culture, but she did not practice the Jewish religion. There's a lot of secular Jews that are born of Jewish culture, but they don't practice the Jewish religion. For those people, they don't, they don't even care. Okay? And is the leadership even always Jewish. All right. So this view is built on the logic that since the Antichrist is just that an anti-Messiah, then his career must be a counterfeit of Jesus first coming. While some of this is true, then it can be, but it can also be carried too far. And then and it goes on to say that the descriptions of the Antichrist are more like that of a political leader. Can we, I think that as much as I've studied the book of Revelation, as much as I've studied the book of Daniel, I can concur with that. That the, that the Antichrist comes across much more as a political leader. Now, this is a guy, he's another, he, this guy's a Hebrew scholar. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum offers a refutation of this reason, which he calls the logical reason. He states that this is the argument, the major premise. The Jews will accept the Antichrist as the Messiah. Minor premise, the Jews will never accept a Gentile as the Messiah. Conclusion, the Antichrist will be a Jew. The difficulties of this argument are many, not the least of which are the two premises. Neither premise can be supported from the Bible just because the Jews make a covenant with the Antichrist. We talked about that last week, right? You remember that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, that the Antichrist makes a covenant with the nation of Israel. Vince asked that question. Who is the covenant? When it says he makes a covenant with many, who is that talking about? Most scholars believe that's talking about the nation of Israel because the prophecy was given to Daniel. 
All right? He says it does not mean they accept him as their Messiah just because they make a covenant. And actually, I brought this up last week when I used Trump as an example. I don't know how gung-ho y'all are for Trump. I hope I didn't get y'all mad. I wasn't trying to say Trump was the Antichrist. Let me say that again. I voted for Trump. I love Trump. But guess what? I ain't trying to follow that man no matter what. I ain't waiting for him to come back. I'm not. Amen. Did, did, uh, do I think he got, do I think there was something that was railroaded? Yep, I sure do. Am I surprised? Nope, I'm sure not. There's so much deception in the land. There's so much garbage in the land. And, and, and it doesn't surprise me one little bit. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is, is this. I made the comment that he made a covenant and he's a Gentile. Mm -hmm. yeah. He made a covenant with the Jews. All right. The difficulties of this argument are many, not the least of which are the two premises. Neither premise can be supported. Okay. He says, secondly, since they are not accepting him as Messiah, but instead a political leader, the fact that he is a Gentile peacemaker is irrelevant. There you go. Okay. A Gentile peacemaker. Yes, ma'am. Okay, what about it? Why don't you read it since you got it? I am come in my father's name and you receive me not. If any if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Yes, that's a good one. So that's a good one. So that does mean like receiving as a political leader? Well, I mean uh, yeah, I mean it does it does that scripture does attribute is it seems to be saying that it could be he could be a Jew. Okay, or at least he's 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 everything to everybody. That's really what he's gonna be. Can we, can we not agree on that? That he's really going to try to be everything to everybody? I'm just, I'm just trying to ask the question. Can we, can we agree on that? Do you think he's going to be everything to everybody? As a matter of fact, the Muslims call him the Mahdi. Okay? The, 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 uh, the New Agers call him the, next, the last avatar. He'll be a Messiah to everybody. He's going to be a Messiah to everybody. Yeah. So. Um, anyway, this guy goes on to say that... Um, that... Uh, Well, read that scripture again. John 5, 43. Yeah, read it again. Um, I am come in my father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, well, there you go. That doesn't say he's so, a Jew. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. Yeah, but, that, but I just want to make Jew. make sure that we're clear on this. That doesn't say I'm he's a Jew. I'm not saying he's a Jew. I'm saying that makes it it's, seem like they'll think he's a Messiah. As a matter of fact, it's Maybe actually saying, but, but, but if we break that scripture down, it's actually saying the opposite. He said, I'm coming in my father's name. Jesus was a Jew. If someone else comes in his own name, you will receive him. Yep. So it's actually, in my opinion, I'm just saying, it's saying the opposite. So I just wanted to make sure we got that clear. No, and I'm, I'm cool with it. just because he said, he said they will not accept him as their Messiah, but I think that that contradicts that. But it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, that, he, that they're, him. it doesn't necessarily mean that they're accepting him as a Messiah as much as a political leader. I mean, you could be right, and I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to say you're not right. You could be right, but I'm just saying that it, it may not be right yeah. that they're accepting him as a I as a that answer. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's good. I, I thought that was good. All right, so I mean, that's enough of that. I mean, well, it does go on to say arguments for a Gentile antichrist, and it talks about Antiochus, and we talked about him several times. In, in the you know, but I don't want to overwhelm us with with all of that again. But anyway, I thought that that was some good. Uh, information there. So let's look here. Now we're going to go ahead and move forward. And I want to take a look at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. All right. So Daniel 10, verse 13. And we already kind of studied some of this already. Whenever we went through, before we started a series on spirit, kind of like talking about spiritual warfare type stuff. Um, when we started our series on Daniel, well, before we started our series on Daniel, when we were talking about the Nephilim and various things like that and hierarchy and spiritual, uh, the spiritual battles that we face and the things that we face, um, the fact that we fight a spiritual war and that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, right? And that many times in the church, people are very like caught up in the fact that they're just they're they're living in the natural and the word of god says in corinthians that the natural mind can't perceive the things of god because they're spiritually understood so really and truly a man must be born again before he even has a chance to understand but look even sometimes whenever we're born again we can still be deceived we can still be deceived by whether it's false doctrine false teachers are espousing it because demon spirits are behind false doctrine we can still be deceived is the point i'm trying to make but look at this so the context of this story is, is that 
the angel comes to share with Daniel. It doesn't explain to us in great detail what Daniel received. But then in chapters 11 and 12, he starts to break down things having to do with the end. Okay, But whatever it was that the angel starts to tell Daniel, it really shakes him up. It says that whenever the angel first showed up, that, they, that the people with him could not hear. So you can go back and read it. It's a short chapter. It'll be a good read tonight before you go to bed. Um, you know, that the, that the men that were with him, when the angel showed up, they, they didn't see it. They didn't hear it. Kind of like when the apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus and the light shined and knocked him down. No, none of the other men heard the voice from heaven. In this situation, the men that were around him, they just got scared and they just took off. And so Daniel was left alone. And the Bible says that he got down on his face and that it was great turmoil from the message that was being given to him. That he was quaking and that he was shaking. And, and, and he had been fasting for three weeks before he got this message from the angel. So it doesn't, again, tell us exactly what the message was. It had to do with Israel. And whatever it was, it disturbed Daniel greatly. Okay, And when we get into chapters 11 and 12, which will end the book of Daniel, we see him talking about the end times. We see him talking even more about the Antichrist. Um, oh, let me just say this. One, of the, I kind of got off the beaten trail um, on that last thing we were talking about. That's actually going to be in Daniel 12, I believe. The main scripture about, about the Antichrist being a Jew. And this is just, it's in the article. But I just want to mention it, and I can't remember exactly where it is. Y'all might be able to see it in the article. But it, do you see it? Is it what is it? Daniel what? Daniel eleven thirty seven, and it talks about the in the King James. This is this is well. Let's just go ahead and go back there real quick, and then we'll move forward. Sorry, Daniel eleven, because this is the main point that I wanted to make. I wanted to give you a scripture. I didn't want to just give you a man's opinion. It says. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, we know that the Antichrist is going to magnify himself, but this is the, one of the main scriptures that, that we say that he is uh, a Jew. Because it says he will not regard the God of his fathers. And they also, this is also a scripture where people believe that he's going to be homosexual. I mean, he might be, but I don't, I don't think that this scripture is saying that. But look, other, other translations say it different, okay? He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. See, that's a completely, and I understand you say, yeah, but I like the King James. Okay, I, that's fine. I, I like the King James too. I'm just trying to make a point that, that that's a huge difference. Is all the only point I'm trying to make. Okay, and so I just don't want us, you or me or anyone else going through life. Yes, ma'am. I heard one preacher say that where it says, or the desire of women. Well, what is the desire of women? It's to have children. Mm -hmm. And so he was like relating that to um, somehow with, you know, children. We, um, yeah, well, yeah, well, I mean, as a matter of fact, it kind of con kind of contradicts yeah. the concept, but every Jewish woman desired in the in the history states that they were hopeful that they might be the mother of Messiah. Many that was like a longing for Jewish women according to the history that you read in the context that you read. Um so that is that is there is a, a, an element of that especially in those times. All right. So we're going back to Daniel, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So Daniel had this was given this message from the angel Gabriel and it was very uh, troubling to him. And what we talked about, we've talked about this before, but it says the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me 21 days. So Daniel was fasting and he was praying and the angel shows up and he says, hey, listen, when your prayer first came before us, we heard the prayer. But then the angel says, but the prince of Persia withstood me. So this is an angel talking to Daniel. And he says, the prince of Persia withstood me. Then look at this. He says, for 21 days, then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now, there's a lot of information there, and you can't just read over that kind of thing because it's kind of like, what in the world is going on, right? That should alert you. So I can tell you that the prince of Persia 
I believe with all my heart in this passage of scripture and later on the Prince of Grisha are fallen angels. Okay. Because first of all, I mean, I'm not saying you've never seen a battle between a supernatural being and a man because Jacob wrestled with God. I get all that. But in this particular passage right here, what we're seeing is we're seeing angelic warfare. And we're seeing the hindrance. Even Vince came up to me the other day and he was asking. He's like, man, Daniel got his prayer right away one time and then this time. And you know what? God's ultimately in control, guys. But it does remind us of the fact that God does want us to pray. Amen. And Daniel was fasting for three weeks and he was praying. And guess what? The prayer broke through. Amen. It made it. And I guarantee you this. It made it exactly in God's timing. Yes. Amen. And exactly when, when God wanted it to, God gave that extra little mm that was needed in order to deliver the message. Amen. And sometimes we wonder why it doesn't it happen when I, because God's not operating on our time frame. He wants us to be faithful to what he wants us to be faithful to. He wants us to be faithful to trusting him and having faith. And he wants us to be faithful to praying and believing him that he that he will can and will move in the midst of our situations. Exactly. But I want you to see here that what we're dealing with is, is we're dealing with principalities and powers. We're dealing with angelic warfare that's going on in the heavenly realm. All right. I also want you to see here. Uh, we, we can go to verse 20 real quick. It would be easier if I just do it like that. Verse 20. Then he said, this is kind of towards the end of the conversation. Then he said, do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. So to me, this is very interesting information, all right? Because we're hearing three different princes' name. We got the arch, we got Michael, the only angel that's spoken of as the arch, as an archangel. We got a prince of Persia, okay, and we got a prince of, of Grecia. Now, I'm just gonna try to draw you a picture real quick of a, of a map, and I hope <coughs> that you can bear with me um, because I just want to try to make a point um, about about this. So, don't laugh at my drawing. So Bridget laughs. <laughs> All right. Let's change this color up a little bit. This was Egypt I was trying to show y'all earlier. This is, uh, this is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, the Persian. This is the, well, I might, I might have went too far, but the Tigris and the Euphrates right here, and that dumps into the Persian <coughs> Gulf. Okay. This is uh, the Black Sea is up here, okay? Uh, and this is, this is a sea here. This is called the Adriatic, and this is called the Aegean Sea. And then this is the big Mediterranean Sea, okay? But this is where all Bible prophecy, this is, this is Israel. This is, this is Greece right here. This is Greece. I'm sorry, this is Italy over here. All right. This is Israel in between here. This is Asia Minor where all the churches of Revelation are located. All right. This is Iraq. Well, modern day Iraq is somewhere around here. Iraq here, Persia, Iran down here. Okay, that's what Persia is, Iran. All right, so the Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia, the Prince of Grisha. What's interesting is, is that as you move forward in the next chapter, we're told by Daniel in prophecy that there's a bunch of war going on between these two. Now, I mean, I don't have time to really break all that down. We've already talked about it a lot, that the, that the power struggle had been going on between Babylon, Persia, Grecia, then later Rome. And all that is played out in the book of Daniel, okay? But the main point that I'm trying to make is, is that there's a principality over Persia. A principality over Greece and look at this Michael is over here over Israel so what I'm trying to make you understand too and now you see my little picture that I tried to do here now let's go to Ephesians because we're talking about principalities and powers real quick because there's there, this is one of the things that we should be aware of all right look it says talk about Jesus right here far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age 
but also in the one to come. So Jesus is over all powers, all dominions, and every name that has ever been named. Amen? Now I want you to know that whenever you look in the, in the Greek, and I'm, I'm going to spare you all this expansion stuff. When you look in the Greek under power, just real quick. Oh, I went to the NASB right here. Principality and power. The word describes jurisdiction. This word power right here. So what I want you to understand is, is that, and now I'm going to go to Ephesians 6, but hold that concept in mind because we're moving forward here. Jurisdiction. You know, you know what jurisdiction would describe? I mean, if you think about it, if you're in Berwick and you drive over the bridge and all of a sudden a policeman stops you. I don't know. You probably wouldn't do this because you're a much better driver than I am and you're not sassy. But if a Berwick policeman stopped me on the other side of the bridge in Morgan City, I probably would have to pray that the Lord didn't let me say this. But I'd probably say, sir, do you have jurisdiction on this side of the bridge? Yeah. I would probably ask, you would probably sir, do you, do you have jurisdiction yeah. on this side of the bridge? And that's what jurisdiction means. Power in a locale or in a location. All right. And so what I want you to know is, is that we have, according to the scripture, we have a prince of Persia. We have a prince of Grecia. We have a prince over Israel. Right. And look what Paul says in Ephesians later on. He says, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Now, if you look that word up, it's an interesting word. Um, it, it, it actually talks about this world rulers. The word is Cosmo Crater. And it's, and it's describing fallen angels that have authority over large areas of the world. And then it breaks it down and it gets even smaller because some of the, the wording here, and I'm not going to go through each one, is describing like demonic spirits. <laughs> and one of the things that I tried to explain when we talked about spiritual warfare is that the world that we live in is fallen. I know you are, hopefully by now you know that. And, but, but at the same time, it's fallen at a level that you and I don't really, I don't know that we completely comprehend. I'm probably going to preach on Halloween. Well, I, I, I didn't even mean to say that speaking word. October the 31st, whenever, whenever it's a Sunday. And whenever I preach on Sunday, I'm going to talk a little bit more, even on, try to break it down even more, the influence of evil that's on the earth the influence of witchcraft that's on the earth all right and we're gonna and, and i'm gonna try to make the point with you know various things to try to show you the the level of deception that is on the face of the earth all right and i don't know that i'll do that great of a job but i'm gonna try and one of the things that i want you to see though is is that nations are ruled by cosmo craters all right and then I would imagine, I can't prove it, but then we come down to a regional level. I mean, let's just say Terrebonne Parish, <laughs> St. Mary Parish. You see what I'm saying? But they have jurisdiction, okay, all the way down to demonic spirits. And whenever I taught about this, I made the point to you that in the New Testament, whenever Jesus cast the demons or the devils out of people, that those devils had jurisdiction over that person's life. And one of the things that I was trying to think about is, and I, I didn't bring you there, but if you go to Job chapter 1, if you go to Ezekiel 27 and 28, if you go to Isaiah, so Job chapter 1, and you, and you hear about the sons of God, and then in Ezekiel chapter 27, he says, he, he gives a prophecy against a city called Tyrus, but then he says, prophesy against the prince of Tyrus, then he says, prophesy against the king of Tyrus. And whenever he starts talking about the king of Tyrus, before you know it, he's talking about the devil. He's talking about Satan. He's describing Satan and how he was created in marvelous and beauty before sin was found in him. And then in Isaiah 14, he starts talking about the king of Babylon. Okay, and then the next thing you know, he's talking about Satan again. And so the point that I'm trying to make is, is that the enemy has always used human beings as vessels. And he's doing it at a much greater level than what we give him credit for. Just as the Holy Spirit desires to use you as a vessel, come on somebody, help me out here. Don't you know that he wants to use you as a vessel? Amen. Don't you know that the Holy Spirit wants to fill you up so that he can pour himself out of you into other people? So that other people can hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So that they can hear that Jesus died on the cross to set them free from the power of sin? So that they also can be liberated? So that they also can tell other people the good news of Jesus Christ? 
Amen? God wants to use you that way. Well, guess what? The devil wants to use people too. And the higher up the ring, the rung of the ladder he can get a hold of someone, the more power he can exert over the world. Does that make sense? I'm just saying. Yes. If I was the devil, I would be going after presidents. I would be going after powerful leaders. Right? But guess what? I, if I was the devil, the little bit that I understand about him from the word of God, I'd get a hold of anything I could. Anything, anybody that lets me have just a little bit, I want more. See? And, he, and, 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 and one of the, this is, I'm really going to close with this right here. Whatever people give jurisdiction. See, God created us with a free will. And it's a beautiful thing that he's given us a free will. Amen. But I have come to believe that God gave us this free will as a gift and that he desires for us to take that free will and to give our lives back to him. Yeah. And so I'm telling you in some way, shape or form, all this weird stuff that goes on in the world, all this occultic magic and force, you know, holding the world in bondage and people, individuals being in bondage in every situation and circumstance. People are taking their free will and they're turning it over to the evil one in some way, shape, or form. They're giving permission. You understand that? These people that are occultic in nature, that have power, that are influencing the world and the decisions that are made and laws that are passed, that we just look at it and we're like, oh yeah, man, that stinks, man. Look what them Democrats did. No, it's so much bigger than that. Come on, man. Quit looking at the puppet show. You got you to put your eyes up here. There's something much bigger going on. Either you believe it or you don't. The natural mind can't perceive the things of God. They're spiritually understood. I'm here to tell you that there is a spiritual warfare that is taking place. And I'm here to tell you that the enemy of your soul and my soul has much more power on this earth than what we give him credit for. Listen, he took, but, but listen, what was the first scripture we read in Ephesians 1 and 21? That his name is above all those names. That he has authority over all of that. Hallelujah. And there's coming a day whenever the enemy of our soul is going to be cast into a lake of fire. Hallelujah. Amen. And there's going to be a millennial reign of the Lord. Amen. And there's going to be peace on earth like never before. And there's going to be eternal glory. And until that day, today is a dress rehearsal. Today is a dress rehearsal. And the question is, who will you live your life for? Amen. Amen. What will you do with the son? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you and praise you, Lord. Thank you for your word that reveals truth to us. I pray, Lord God, that you would open up our eyes, that we could see in our hearts, Lord God, that we could receive your truth. Lord, we desire to know truth. We desire to be able to see. The Apostle Paul said to be sober because our adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That was probably Peter. But Paul, Paul said, be sober for the day is getting the day is nearer now. Than when we first began. And, and for us not to be because people that are drunk are drunk in the night. People that are asleep are asleep in the night. And that believers are not supposed to be asleep or drunk. And they're not supposed to be under a spell. Like the Apostle Paul told the Galatian church. Who has bewitched you? The church is not supposed to be under a spell. The church is supposed to be wide, wide eyed. Uh, awake. And sober spiritually. So that they can see the signs of the times. And so that they can be about their father's business just like their master was. So Holy Spirit, we need your help. Holy Spirit, I pray for each and every one of us in this place. Lord, that you give us a hunger and a desire and a thirst to understand your word. To be able to see the truth, oh Lord God. Lord, help us to be able to see and to navigate life in these difficult times, in these deceptive times. Lord, we need your help. We don't want to be led astray. We don't want to be deceived. Lord, we thank you for your word, oh Lord God, that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Be blessed. Amen.